Today, uh, once again, we have a piece which, if you are acquainted with Tolkien through The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, will have struck you as more than a little odd. Um, and in this particular case, we are, in one sense, relieved of the burlesque associated with Farmer Giles of Ham, and we look at Tolkien from an altogether different perspective. We see him engaged, uh, once again, as in, on fairy stories, with scholarship and with the legacy of the materials that he studies quite regularly. He offers us uh, a plausible attempt to interpret a particular document, the Battle of Malden. But he does so in what we would have to describe as an unconventional way. This is not, if you, if you, for example, are acquainted with what we might think of as the archetypal academic essay interpreting a work of literature, right? This doesn't look like that. And the reason, of course, is that Tolkien is approaching the matter in part with his tongue in his cheek. So, for example, he wants to draw our attention to the fact that it's being published in a particular journal. And because it's being published in a particular journal, he's aware of what an article in such a journal should look like. This is page 21, if you will. He says in the second sentence, to merit a place in essays and studies, it must, I suppose, that is this piece, contain at least by implication criticism of the matter and manner of the old English poem or of its critics, <laughs> right? So what he does is give us a kind of backwards characterization of the academic enterprise of literary interpretation, and he's suggesting to us nothing less than that he finds it inadequate. If you were to answer the question, in what way does he find it? inadequate, you would have to point to what component in this piece as a whole. What part doesn't look like standard literary criticism, Joe? <laughs> it's certainly not the afterword on over mode, right, that begins on 21. What doesn't look like standard literary criticism? Chapter 2, The Homecoming of Bam. <laughs> That's right. We have what amounts to a three-part discussion of the Battle of Malden, which begins on page three with a historical characterization as well as a description of the poem itself. On page four, for example, we discover in the first full paragraph that it exists as a fragment. It exists as a fragment. He gives us the historical background in August of the year 991 in the reign of Athelred II, popularly known as Athelred the Unready. A battle was fought near Malden in Essex, that is in Southeast England, so on and so on. So he gives us all of that material, which on one level is quite scholarly. And in part three, he gives us a kind of analytical essay, however brief. And in the middle, <coughs> excuse me, in the middle, he inserts what can only be described, well, do you know the term? It's a closet drama. Do you know the term? Can you tell me what a closet drama is? It's a play or drama that takes place in a very confined area. Yes. Um, like a, uh, like a, well, a cabin in the woods. Yes, that's part of it, yes, that's part of it. Strictly speaking, a closet drama is written in the form of dialogue, perhaps even with directions and scenic characterizations, but it's not meant to be performed. Instead, it's simply meant to be read. So he gives us an elaborate piece of criticism on the Anglo-Saxon poem, The Battle of Malden, the major portion of which is a closet drama. This is unconventional in and of itself, and it's something that only an extraordinarily skilled person can bring off. Because creative writing, on the one hand, 
and impersonal scientific literary criticism on the other are complements to one another, to be sure, but they don't mingle very easily or very comfortably. So only someone with the chutzpah of Tolkien can bring it off. Let's talk for a moment about the drama itself. As I said, it's the major component. It begins on page seven, and for all practical purposes, there are really only two speakers, though other voices come in at the end. And the two speakers are contemporaries of the battle that was fought in 991. And they're coming to the battlefield in the immediate aftermath, within, say, 24 hours or so, maybe less. And the two men are characterized very distinctly, but very differently from one another. In what ways are they different from one another? Their names are Tiedwald and Torchthelm, nicknamed respectively Tida and Tota. We'll come back to that in a moment. Go ahead, please, Sam. Well, I thought one of them, uh, I terrible. You want to try to pronounce it, to uh, pronounce the names. It's uh, Torchthelm. You can call him Tota if you like. Yes. Um, very pessimistic. Kind of like outside One is. Moments, yes. I'm afraid. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And that. And yes. The other one's like, well, have. Have uh, courage. Yes, your... that's right. One is the voice of an inexperienced person who feels alternately trepidation and its opposite. And we'll talk about the opposite in a moment. The other, Tiedwald, speaks how. He does indeed encourage him, says, you know, well, he says basically, keep your shit together, right? <laughs> But who says that kind of thing? What is Tiedwald himself like as a person, a character? Go ahead, please, yes. While he's less pessimistic, he should be more cynical. Aha! Shall, well, all right. Cynical is one possibility, yes? Cynical, it seems to me, is one possibility. One is fearful and alternately eager the other is practical, perhaps even slightly brutish, and maybe even cynical. Are they somehow different in a more obvious way? Go ahead, Joe. Um, Who would tend to be timid and eager in alternating passages on the one hand, and who would tend to be practical, maybe even a bit brutish, and even cynical on the other. What's the, the fundamental difference, Lacey, between them? One is a lot younger. Yes, than right. The other one. Yeah. yeah, one is the voice of age, one is the voice of youth, right? One is the voice of experience, one is the voice of callowness in experience. And so what accounts in part for Tata's alternating eagerness and timidity is that, frankly, he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, right? He's been sent, along with Tiedwald, to find Berknoth's body and to bring it back to the monks of Ely for proper burial. They know each other. They're well acquainted, but one is older, one is younger. This makes a significant difference all the way throughout the closet drama. Because what they've come there to do in the aftermath of a justly famous battle, already it's beginning, as it were, to gain its reputation the night after the battle, is collect a body that they can legitimately anticipate has been cruelly ill-used because he has died in hand-to-hand -hand combat with edged weapons, right? 
that means it's very likely he has been cut to pieces, or at the very least, badly mauled and marred. What's more, there are a lot of bodies. What's more still, they've been sent in the dark. They have one lantern with a candle in it. So they're searching dead bodies, cruelly marred by edged weapons, in the dark. Can you characterize such a scene for me? How does it strike you? What kind of an environment or milieu is it? What do you think? Yes, please. Probably a very grayish environment. <laughs> right. If we were, in fact, to put it on as described, we were actually to perform it, right? They would be little more than shadows. They might be momentarily illuminated by the uncovering of the candle in their own lantern. But they're being very careful and very circumspect for reasons we'll talk about in a moment. So they're on a battlefield among the dead at night with one candle. Can you tell me any more? Yeah, please, go ahead. Um, well, to me, it seems like they're kind of almost like, even though they're causing no one, to me, they just seem almost like grave robbers. <laughs> right. And in fact, there are virtual grave robbers in the drama, aren't there, right? So they're to be considered, in that sense, maybe a step up from grave robbers. But their mission, at the very least, though it appears ghoulish to us, and perhaps even to some degree to Tolkien, is nevertheless ultimately a sacred one because they've been sent by the monks at Ely to retrieve that body for proper entombment, right? So that they can sing mass over it. You will recall, of course, how does the play end with the monks chanting in Latin, a passage that we'll have to look at in just a little while. So what we come to is that the environment is ghoulish. They're among the dead. And they're the only shadows of living things that we see among the dead for a preponderance of the drama. Other people show up later. But for the most part, it's these two men amid hundreds of dead. Do you want to read that further? Their environment, their milieu? Does it sound pleasant to you? Do you have any idea, even within just a few hours, what a battlefield of this kind would smell like. Tolkien makes no allusion to it, but he was at the Battle of the Somme for five months. He knows perfectly well what it smells like, even after only a few hours. You want to read the scene for me a little more thoroughly? Two ghoulish men albeit on a sacred mission, among the dead in the dark. Do you want to go back to fairy stories for a moment and dip your ladle into the cauldron of storytelling? What kinds of archetypes are we working with here? Because that's the term that Tolkien doesn't use in on fairy stories, but it's largely what he means. What kinds of archetypes are we dealing with here? Is this a drama about the year 991? Well, of course not, Joe. What is it? I think it's a drama about human nature. Yes? In what circumstances? Um, <laughs> in extremely trying yes, circumstances. Yes, right? This is, if you like, then, archetypally, a drama about human beings confronting the fundamental dilemmas of their mortal existence. It is nothing less than that in these brief pages. And the characterization, I'm afraid we will have to say, in contrast to the overt burlesque of Farmer Giles, is really quite grim. James, you wanted to make a remark, please. Go ahead. It also has some traits of a journey to the underworld. It does, indeed. Especially with, uh, with um, 
With Tata, with yes. Tata the younger man. Of a nightmarish creature yes. lurking in that's right. and so on. Yeah, since you bring that up, let's jump ahead to that for just a moment, shall we? Because the conditions in which we find ourselves, those of massed heaps of the brutally slain, in the dark, with two quasi-ghoulish figures wandering almost hopelessly among them, is indeed a characterization of one view of the human position in the physical universe. It is also, of course, a vision that is contaminated by, necessarily informed by, the archetype of damnation the archetype of hell. Where are we? We're among the brutally slain dead and we have other living companions on the field. Companions against whom Tata in particular reacts in ways which perhaps seem predictable but which Tolkien also views askance. These really are ghouls. They have come to rob the dead. Whatever the Vikings in their victory have left behind of value, these robbers of the dead, pillagers, come sneaking out at night to retrieve. On some level, that sounds absolutely contemptible, doesn't it? It's a horrifying thing to do. All of these men have died in violent ways. And these scavengers come out in the dark like vultures to pluck at their corpses and find whatever of value they can find, whatever the Vikings have left. So not only is it hellish because of the circumstances we've described, it is hellish because these dead men are themselves subject to further indignities. Disrespectful maltreatment. Contrast that, for example, with what happens when Tiedwald actually does find Berknoth's body. Do you remember what he does, what he says to Tata? Tata's chattering away, as a nervous young man can be expected to do, right? He never shuts up. And Tita says to him, basically, shut up now. <laughs> Be silent for a moment. And he even says, bow your head. So in contrast to the pillagers, Tiedwald adopts the posture of reverence towards this dead man in particular. Contrast that for me, if you would please, with his treatment of the dead Vikings. How does he respond to them? They're looking among the bodies, trying to find Bertel, and of course they have to go through Viking bodies as well as Anglo-Saxon bodies. How does he react to dead Vikings? Go ahead, please. Well, uh, what well, so stood out to me is the one where uh, Todd is like, uh, step away from this guy because his Yes, that's right. Uh, His eyes are like Grendel's in the moon. Yeah, Tita's is basically like, who cares as long as he's dead? Yeah, he, yeah. He, he's, he's in dead. hell. <laughs> he's in hell. He's in hell. Basically, the only good game is... That's right. That's basically what he says, right? They're heathens, so to hell with them. Right? So he has no compassion in this instance, though he has compassion elsewhere, compassion and reverence. He has no compassion in this instance for the dead heathens. So when he comes to Bertnoth's body, his posture is really quite striking. And it's also to be contrasted with the way that Torchtel has been behaving throughout the play. Not only are their actions, therefore, called into the foreground for our perusal, in this terrible, ghoulish, and hellish situation. Their speech in particular is meant by Tolkien, I want to submit to you, to be closely and carefully evaluated because they don't talk the same way 
In fact, they speak very differently from one another. At one point, Tata says to Tito, you're a brute. To which Tito responds, it's just the facts. So what we know about the older, more experienced man is that he relies on the physical characteristics of what's going on around him. This is what I see. This is what is. Tata, the younger man, is very different. Why would he call such an attitude and such types of speech as Tiedwald uses brutish? Why would he say they're brutish? What is the other very interesting characteristic of the younger man's speech? Go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say, it seemed like Tiedwald yeah. Tied Tiedwald. Mm -hmm. Tied It's actually a very interesting question, right? And if you don't mind, I'd like to save it for later. Okay. Tiedwald, I will say only in response at this stage, is more grounded and also more pragmatically Christian than Tata, right, than the younger man. So is that a fair characterization? Yes. All right. So the difference between them in terms of speech is that the older man is grounded. He's a lot more like Farmer Giles except he's much more serious of mood. We're told already in the preface that the older man is basically a land-owning farmer, right? He's not a rich man, he's not of noble birth, but he's a loyal subject and citizen of his region. But that means that like Farmer Giles, he has a certain pragmatic posture towards what's going on around him. And that means, in turn, that a person like Tata would find him brutish, would find him unsophisticated, would find him unsatisfactory, in point of fact. Why? What is, what is it with, with the younger man, anyway? When he talks, and he talks so differently from the older man, how does he sound? He sounds frightened frequently, especially when we first see him, right? So he's timid, we know that. What else, though? He balances his timidity with something that initially you might never expect, but which, when you look back on it, makes perfect sense. When are the timid heroic? Go ahead, Betsy. They're being rash. Yes, right? That could very easily be one of the opportunities. And he is rash at a certain point in the drama, isn't he? There is, however, one rather larger domain, it seems to me, in which the timid are heroic. Go ahead. Well, he was poetic line. That's right. Tata speaks poetry. They both technically are made to speak in an Anglo-Saxon verse form, the kind of verse in which, for example, Beowulf and the Battle of Malden are both written. <laughs> so they both technically speak poetry, but only Torchthelm speaks poetry. What kind of poetry does he speak? Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I said um, uh, the younger man, right? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of poetry does he speak? I mean, is it about flowers and girls and romance? I'm probably not reading it right. Um, but I thought it was something in like the beat of how he was talking. Uh -huh. um, but it, does that go for both of the men or just? Yes okay. and no, right? Because on the one hand, they are both speaking in the same verse form, but they're not using the <laughs> same syntactic sequences and they're not using the same vocabulary, except at one point, and one point only. In fact, it's the point at which, page 18, Tata calls Tita a brute. And he responds, just past the middle of the page, this is the older man speaking now, Tidwald. It's only plain language. 
If a poet sang you, I bowed my head on his breast, beloved, and weary of weeping, woeful slept I. Thus joined we journeyed, gentle master and faithful servant, over fen and boulder to his last resting and love's ending. You'd not call it cruel. So right there, he himself, with the voice of experience and perhaps everything that that entails, points out the comparative vacuousness, or at least the relative inappropriateness of the younger man's mode of speech. This is not a place for poetic language, though it's delivered to us, strictly speaking, in poetry. Or let us say it is not a place only for poetic language. Because at the risk of sounding frivolous, and I don't wish to, I want to remind you of the nicknames these two men bear, Tida and Tata. Uh huh? Tida, Tata. Huh? Where are you, Sam? Teeter. It's Tita Tata, right? So whether Tolkien has done this subliminally, is not conscious of the kind of implicit joke that he's making, he's the one who assigned the nicknames. And their nicknames are Tita Tata. A seesaw. What does the seesaw do? It goes back and forth. It goes up and down, right? One time you're up, the other time your antagonist is up. So that these two going back and forth or up and down are providing us with two angles from which to view this terrible existential domain, this hellish environment, this borderland of hell in which they find themselves. One of them is an earth digger, a farmer. He's practical and down to earth. He may, and indeed we're told by Tolkien, he has fought in a number of battles because each land-owning farmer is obliged when called to bring his relatively simple weapons, usually a spear and a knife, seldom a sword, almost never a coat of mail, maybe a shield. He's obliged to bring those with him to the levy of troops to defend their county or region. So he's been in battles. And he's sort of like, you know, that grizzled old sergeant in the platoon in every World War II movie you've ever seen ever, right? <laughs> who is the voice of experience, who is maybe sort of slightly cynical about the glories of battle, who's seen too many people's heads explode in front of him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Torchthelm is the brand new private who gets killed in three weeks. Nobody ever even knows his name, right? That's how those movies go. And he comes with ideas of glory. He comes with ideas of the poetic qualities of violence. And thus we are asked, I'll come right back, we are asked in part to look at this scene, this terrible hellish scene, from both points of view in alternating fashion. Go ahead, Sam. I was just going to add to your point. On page 11, yes. the bottom, and, um, Forza and Tita, they, like, it really clearly stated like, the wool cheese and something yes. off his head, yes. the blood for us, you know, backs is what murder it is. This yes, that's he right. He said, well, this is about for you, like what you sing of in your, like, glorified songs, yes. poems about it. It yes. was just like, exactly what you were saying. Yeah, oh, yes, I think that's a perfect example. Right, that is a perfect example of what we've been talking about these last few moments. That is, among the things that Tolkien clearly wants to do is position us here among the dead and interrogate us about our ideas of warfare and violence and slaughter, but also glory, necessity, and the inescapable nature of the world in which we find ourselves. All of these questions are on the imaginary stage in front of us right now. So it's true, is it not, <coughs> Pardon me. that in any battle in which men are at close quarters combat with edged weapons, horrible maiming is likely to take place. And the death is also likely to be extraordinarily painful. You know, if you're blown up, it's one thing. Right there you are, you're, you're all over the landscape, you're dead. And that's horrible enough, God knows. But in this particular case, 
these men are at close quarters facing each other and they must at some level see each other as human beings in the way that a drone pilot simply cannot, right? That's modern warfare. And yet these weapons have terrible effects. They're primitive, they're pre-technological, but they have been designed with extraordinary brilliance to do maximum damage. Yes, they're looking for his corpse. They're looking for a corpse that since they know what battle is like, the older man in particular, they can legitimately expect to be like many of the other corpses they search out at first that is terribly hewn and mutilated. I want to pause here for a moment and remember Farmer Giles, which I want to suggest to you, perhaps with an element of controversy, has sentiments actually rather similar albeit in burlesque form, to this play. Anybody want to respond to that? Yes, go ahead, please. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, all right, okay, that's right. Yes, Charlie. There's sort of a disgust for yes. the upper classes. Yes, yeah, yeah. There is a kind of, at least, even though there's a degree of reverence, Tolkien is not so willing to go so far in Farmer Giles as to say the king is a coward. He isn't, right? But he has illegitimate expectations of his subjects. And while that is rendered in humorous, satirical form in Farmer Giles, in this play, it is rendered in tragic form. So that we see also Tolkien is competent in both genres. He can do comedy, he can do tragedy, and he's good at both. So in this tragic version, the upper classes, whatever reverence they may deserve, and Tolkien's not ready to say that they deserve absolutely none, nevertheless are at fault. It's partly their fault that we're out here in the dark amid heaps of brutally slain men looking for the leader to give him to the monks so he at least can have a glorious funeral. Why is it his fault? Why is it Bergnoth's fault, Charlie? For letting them right. cross. The central lines, the crucial lines in Battle of Mold, that Tolkien wants to comment on are not the ones that in his time were typically the focus of analytical discourse. And he says that, as if it really were a seesaw, you have to read both sets of lines together in order to understand the implications of the poem. And so his preface, his closet drama, his overmode, essay, part three. All of these are designed to put before us two pieces of the Battle of Malden. The one that everybody in Tolkien's generation and beforehand focused on were those famous words which he himself quotes on page five. And then he translates them for you as well. These are spoken in the final extremity, in the moment of the last stand, when Berchtelm himself, Berchnoth himself, is already dead. And all that are left around him are his household bodyguard, his professional warriors. They're the ones who have swords as well as spears and shields, and they have chain mail and helmets. They're not like Tiedwald. They're aristocrats. And their code of heroic conduct is articulated here in the italicized quotation at the bottom. Hia shall the herdra, herdra the kenra, mod shall the mara, the uramayan lutlaf. And that is translated more or less accurately for you below. Will shall be the sterner, heart the bolder, spirit the greater, as our strength lessens. 
So it's a kind of heroic oath of defiance against overwhelming odds. It's what you say when you are preparing to die in defense of the things you have sworn to. And of course, when you think of Tolkien as having been born in the late Victorian era, having come of age in World War I with all of its follies as well as it must be said, its occasional glories, you realize that a phrase like that would be at the forefront of almost every patriotic Englishman's thinking, at least until after the experience of the trenches. But where Tolkien is especially brilliant is not also in setting it against the alternative passage, which we'll come to in a moment. It is in recognizing that this particular speech is reflective of an ethos that guides men even into folly-laden excesses that are suicidal. If you want to put it in more modern terms, it's an ideological entrapment that he recognizes here. And he thinks that the original poet who composed the Battle of Malden, probably shortly thereafter, knew it too. What's the alternating passage? The one he wants to set against the heroic boast or oath. I beg your pardon, I usually turn that off for class and I'm very sorry. What's the one he wants to set the heroic passage against? It's a gratuitous line, it would seem, in the poem, but it offers a commentary on Berthnot's own behavior. What is it? Do you recall? It's the passage where, go ahead please, yes. Um, then the Earl and his overmastering yes. pride actually yielded ground to the yes. enemy as he should not have. As he should not have done, is the implication. That's not technically in the text, right? What the text says is tofela, too much. He yielded too much ground, which of course is an implicit com a commentary, he shouldn't have done it. And in point of fact, if he were a strategic leader, he wouldn't have done it. Why? Come on, think of strategy for just a moment. What's his position when he draws up his defense force against the Vikings? What's his position, James? He sits across a bridge. Yes, right, and it's a peculiar kind of bridge. It's a causeway. It's a hardened, slightly raised area which at high tide is covered up. So it's like, I don't know if, you, if you've ever been, for example, to St. Michael's Mountains in, in southern, southwestern England, near Penzance. That is reached by a similar kind of causeway, which is just a little ways above the water most of the time. And you know, of course, from classical Roman narratives that three men can hold a bridge against a multitude. So he has the tactical and the strategic advantage. His force can't be very large. The Vikings are at least equally numerous, if not more numerous. But he has the advantage of the text, uh, in the text, of the ground. The Vikings cannot prevail without extraordinary loss on their side. And they could probably be repulsed, although second-guessing a general's decisions is too easy. But they persuade him to let them come across. He yields ground to them, tofela, too much. And when they're across, face-to-face -face battle, is joined. And because in all likelihood, they're not only the more brutal because they're pagans in the view of the poet and probably of Tolkien, but also because they're probably more experienced. These are a bunch of farmers with a small number of aristocratic professional warriors. And they're probably more numerous. So what on earth could have motivated Bernoth to let them come across. 
We know how this works. First of all, what would they have done to persuade him? You know what they would have done. You got two boys standing face to face and there's a line between them. What do they do? I dare you to step across the line. Are you chicken? Or I dare you to let me cross the line. Are you chicken? Are you chicken? <laughs> So, and I don't mean to treat it glibly or reductively, but Tolkien himself is moving in the direction of saying to us, this not only was a bad decision, tactically, a mistake, it was made for bad reasons. He would never put it this grossly, but it's two boys in a pissing contest. And one of them got the better because he said basically, are you chicken? And Bernoth, cannot endure that. If he were a brilliant tactical leader, he'd say, eh, maybe so, but I've got the high ground, come get it. Right? Federal troops at Gettysburg, we've got the high ground, come get it, we're not coming to you. Right? And that's the high water mark of the Confederacy, that's the end. Although it takes two years to bring it about. So I've got the high ground, come get it. No, he resigns that advantage and if it were only about Bernoth, that would be one thing. But it isn't only about Bernoth. And this is where Tolkien, the soldier from World War I, finds his voice. What happens to people like Tiedwald and Torchthelm and all of those other Anglo-Saxon men lying dead on the battlefield when the leader makes a mistake. Well, it's the Battle of Balaclava. It's the charge of the Light Brigade. He even makes explicit reference to that on page 25. Of course, he's willing to recognize that the men who died beside Bernoth are heroic in that they were true to their oaths when they received their weapons and their status and when they ate at the Lord's table and made their boasts, they committed themselves to dying with him if that was necessary. And they do, all of them. As he says, it was their duty. About four, eight lines from the top of 25. In their situation, heroism was superb. Their duty was unimpaired by the error of their master and more poignantly, neither in the hearts of those near to the old man was love lessened. It is the heroism of obedience and love, not of pride or willfulness, that is the most heroic and the most moving. You might also read there the most tragic. From Wiglaf, Beowulf's companion, under his kinsman's shield facing the dragon, to Berchtwald at Malden, who speaks the heroic oath, down to Balaclava, even if it is enshrined in verse, no better than the charge of the Light Brigade. So two angles on this terrible event, this defeat of the English, this slaughter of the soldiers. One says, it's heroic, it's superb, it's brilliant. And the younger man ties it in with past tradition and he poetizes it in heroic verse. The older man providing the other experience, the down-to-earth, deeply rooted character who's seen too much already, depoetizes it even mocks the poetizing of it and says to the younger man, it's not what you think. Who is right? In a discourse like this, you might expect that someone would prevail. It's a kind of debate, isn't it? And you would expect that someone might prevail. Does someone prevail? Or would we dare to say that tragically both of them 
are right. Both of them are wrong. That would seem to me to suggest that this hellish landscape in which we find ourselves in the play and which has been created in part by Berknoth's mistake, Berknoth's mistake driven by the very things that the younger man Torchtown quotes and engenders and remembers and glories in, driven by an ideological commitment to heroic excess, overmode, which is the Anglo-Saxon gloss for Latin superbia, supreme pride. Pride as a vice, yes, the pride of Satan, as Tolkien himself remarks. It would seem to me then that they arrive at a place where they must recognize that there's no escape for them. In a sense, as Robert E. Lee is quoted as saying just before the Battle of Gettysburg in the novelization of that experience, this war goes on and on as if it could have no end. And it would seem that in a text like this one, the definition of war is not only brutal and inglorious, however admirable the defense of the household guard may have been, and it is, Tolkien is, is clear on that. It goes on and on. The killing never really stops. Now, if we were to end the play there, we would be in a kind of existential, inescapable domain where we would recognize that we are simply helpless and at the mercy of forces greater than ourselves. But it doesn't end there, does it? How does it end? They retrieve the body, even though the head is gone, it's never recovered, maybe taken as a trophy, maybe it fell into the black water. Go ahead. We um, have a voice saying mm -hmm. to row on. Mm -hmm. I thought it was the Vikings. Probably not. Probably not. Probably not. Too polite. Yes. And then we have the monks um, giving a uh, prayer. Yes. Uh, it ends with the chanting of the monks, not with the unresolved dilemma articulated in the seesaw of their dialogue. It ends with a kind of definitive voice from the monks, speaking not in heroic Anglo-Saxon verse, speaking not in poetry per se, of that kind, but in poetry of an entirely different kind. First of all, Charlie, what language? That's Latin, right? It's church Latin. Not that insular Latin in which the, the compiled narrative of Farmer Giles was put together, but church Latin. Church Latin articulated still in the dark, still sadly spoken, but such that whoever's rowing the boat pauses to listen. It's arresting, yes? It stops us in our movement. Now, it'd be nice to know what it is. What are they saying? And what they're saying is a passage from the fifth psalm. Lead me in thy ways, Lord. Bring me to the blessed temple where I will fall in adoration to you. And then it's combined with, because of course that's a Hebrew poem, yes? the Old Testament. It's combined with the final language which is Christian. Gloria patri et filio et spiritu sancto sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper et in saecula saeculorum and then they begin to repeat the psalm itself. So they contextualize the old psalm which is a hymn begging for leadership and proclaiming adoration of the Lord on the one hand. And a phrase 
which speaks to the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, explicitly Christian, not Hebrew, and says, it was in the beginning, it is now, and it always is in eternity. Saikula, saikulor. So though it's brief, though it comes in at the end, the pious Catholic, Tolkien, sincerely pious, as I want to stress over and over again, seems to suggest that it's enough. That is what, well, in terms of fairy stories, what is that, right? We've had this sequence of fantastic events in an other world, which is a lot like hell, and at the end of it, what happens in fairy stories? Right, there is a sudden joyous turn, a new catastrophe, and redemption is laid out before us. All of this occurs, on the one hand, in a world that's doomed. For Tolkien, the physical universe is potentially beautiful and perfect, but it's damaged. And the lives we lead in it also, therefore, are damaged. But the redemption out of it, the train to Niggles Parish, right, is the sudden unexpected catastrophe that he also describes the Gospels as containing, right? So the tragedy is turned suddenly to joyousness and celebration, stern in fact though it may be. Any final remarks? Thank you, everyone. I shall see you then on Friday.